time once again for Community Forum. And we are very lucky to have with us live in the studios this, nor- this morning, Steve Meacham and Joshua Ferris. Steve Meacham is the lead organizer at City Life, Vida Urbana, based in Boston. And Joshua Ferris, who has been on the show several times before, is the lead organizer at SAFE, Standing Against Foreclosure and Eviction. And that will be the subject of this morning's interview, Foreclosure and Eviction. Steve and Joshua, thank you very much for coming and spending time with us again this morning. Our pleasure, Thanks, Mike. Mike. So, Josh, start out, uh, tell us a bit about SAFE. Uh, SAFE uh, started in uh, uh, 2012. May 1st was our first meeting. Uh, it was coming out of a, a City Life uh, uh, training in Tacoma that uh, Bill Moyer with a Backbone campaign had organized. And uh, some members that were Occupy activists had gone down to Tacoma from Seattle. And uh, we came back to Seattle from that um, two-day conference and uh, started SAFE. Um, we had, our intention was to um, to emulate and to replicate uh, replicate uh, the bank tenant uh, association organizing model that uh, City Life had been uh, working with for several years. And um, uh, I and personally, I was really inspired by Steve and uh, Lauren and uh, uh, City Life's uh, presentation in general. I'd heard about City Life for years, but it was really great to 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 hear from directly from them what their work looks like, and that's the work we wanted to do. Plus, this is the same time what Occupy Our Homes is happening, and Safe's a part of that Occupy Our Homes movement coming out of the Occupy movement. And um, it's also interesting to find out that Occupy Our Homes Minneapolis, which was really hot during that time, they actually were started as well from a, a, a City Life trainer going to Minneapolis. So um, yeah, that's that's the uh, that's the period of time Safe came out of, and uh, that's our connection with City Life. I mean, really, we're standing on their shoulders, you know, <laughs> trying to look down on. <laughs> <laughs> we were. Uh, this is Steve. We were certainly honored to be out here for that founding of Safe, and uh, we were doing a lot of traveling at that time in 2012 because, as Josh said, uh, after the Occupy movement, was looking for new ways to implement the principles of Occupy. And the uh, the specific wing of Occupy that developed Occupy Our Homes was uh, looking to use this method or similar methods all across the country. So we were doing a lot of traveling just to uh, talk to people about how to about how to set it up. And because the foreclosure crisis was just so devastatingly bad all everywhere, but uh, it's been such a pleasure to come back now after two and a half years and see just how well Safe is doing. And now, um, you know, thinking of starting up a new chapter really. So that's. That's been really great to be here and to see such a great turnout last night at the conference. And that conference is the conference uh, you uh, are coordinating, Joshua, the uh, Housing is a Human Right Radical Organizing Conference. Well, SAFE initiated it, but Mm. we're working with the Tenants Union. Um, We've got members from the Transit Writers Union, uh, Seattle Solidarity Network, uh, Backbone Campaign, Rising Tide. A lot of different good, uh, good uh, lefty organizations are involved in this conference. It's a and it's a our first radical organiz, uh, rag, radical organizing conference. Steve's been a part of a hundred of them, but you know, it's the first one I've kind of <laughs> initiated, helped initiate. And that's it happening today too at uh, Hillman City Collaboratory. They're on fifty six twenty three Rainier Avenue South. Certain uh, workshops today starting at one. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. We're going to have lunch at 12, uh, get together with the, uh, the people from the different organizations. And we got uh, three workshops happening at 1, and then three more happening, um, I think, about 2.30. So there, there'll be six workshops to choose from. Um, and then 5 p.m. tonight at the Collaboratory, we're having a panel discussion. A lot of great uh, activists are going to be on that panel. Gene Barton from the Barton Campaign this summer will be on that. Uh, uh, Lisa from... Uh, from uh, a houseless activist with Nicholsville, also a safe organizer, be tenants union reps, and uh, Steve, of course, will be on that panel. Uh, a lot of good people, so that, that that'll be something not to miss. We're really delighted that that there's such a connection between the radical organizing conference and on the ground anti foreclosure and anti displacement organizing. You know, we've uh, stressed for a while at City Life. We've been around 41 years, but we've stressed for a while the importance of having a radical analysis as something that a popular radical analysis as something that doesn't put you on the fringe, but it creates a broader opportunity to organize. And there's lots of examples in the foreclosure crisis and in our tenant organizing where if we didn't have that analysis, we couldn't have organized such a broad movement. 
So we think there's really a connection and that the way that SAFE is uh, making that connection is certainly in the, in the tradition that we're used to. So talk about the foreclosure crisis. When, how did we get here? When did it come about? Well, you know, for us, we've often talked about the foreclosure crisis, that the significant event was the housing bubble. And, you know, for a long while, there was a, a very important uh, emphasis placed on predatory lending, but predatory loans were, in our opinion, defined too narrowly. They were defined as loans that had bad terms, such as adjustable rate mortgages, arms, things like that. And those were really bad loans. But more generally, the financial industry really deliberately set about to create this housing bubble. And there's many communities that had uh, a vast uh, you know, inflation in housing prices. And in order to buy any house in your community, uh, this especially affected communities of color across the country, in order to buy any house in your community, you had to you know, kind of get strapped into a mortgage that was at a value that was just way too high. And, uh, and you were being encouraged to do that by all kinds of institutions. So when that bubble inevitably burst, it left millions and millions of homeowners all across the country with underwater loans, that the amount they owed on their mortgage was far higher than what their house was worth. And that was not a quote unquote normal market fluctuation. That was the deliberate you know, thing created by Wall Street to make profit. And they profited on the rise and they profited on the fall. So we have been demanding for many years that since they created the crisis, they should pay for it in the form of principal reduction, you know, reducing the amount that homeowners actually owe to real market value. And how did you address the issue of some media coverage, a significant amount, painting the fault at the, uh, the homeowners, the people that had uh, taken out these, these new mortgages on their houses? Well, you know, this is that moral hazard argument, you know, that, the, that they try to use. And, you know, if moral hazard, uh, if you're going to use that argument, you have to explain why millions of homeowners all across the country suddenly had mortgage problems. Why did the mortgage rate go up so badly? Was it just because uh, there was a sudden uh, desire on the part of millions of people simultaneously to sin? You know, and, uh, you know, we just think that's absurd that the only way that you can explain the uh, rapid increase in foreclosure problems is the fact that something else happened and that something else was the housing bubble and predatory lending. And cl clearly, you know, you go back and the reason that the big banks have settled with such massive, uh, you know, settlements of $20 billion over and over again is because they can't defend themselves against the charges that they did predatory lending. And so people ought to look at that history and not forget it in terms of uh, figuring out why people got into this mess. And it should be said too that when we bailed out the banks in 2008 to the tune of about $700 billion, that was about the total amount of negative equity in the country. We could have taken that money and reduced every homeowner in the country down to real value. That would have solved the crisis but it, by helping homeowners rather than just by giving money to the banks that nobody knows what happened to it. Yeah, it, my friends aren't as fond of saying it's not the people that didn't pay their bills, it's the banks that didn't pay their bills. And um, I mean, that's, that's, what, that's what we're talking about. We talk about this bailout and uh, this missing uh, piece of wealth here. But it's really been siphoned off and, and, and is shown in this, ex this exploding uh, economic inequality. You know, the part of the, uh, you know, the, the use of this moral hazard argument got so extreme on the part of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, the two giant uh, federally supported mortgage banks that own over half of all mortgages that they were refusing to, uh, they were, they were evicting people in foreclosed buildings, even though there were nonprofits offering what they said was the fair market value of the buildings, but they weren't willing to sell to nonprofits because the nonprofits would resell to the former owners or rent to the former owners. So Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac were saying, well, we're not going to do that because we're so committed ideologically to this moral hazard argument that we're not gonna take this way out that actually would save us money and help the homeowner because we wanna punish the homeowner. And it was just astounding. And they just finally threw in the towel on part of that just a few weeks ago. And, and um, the new director of Fannie and Freddie Melwatt uh, agreed to direct Fannie and Freddie to start negotiating fair market deals with nonprofits. So that was a big victory around the country. But it took, you know, we, uh, we were saying last night, we, we engaged just ourselves at City Life in 53 protests over three years 
against Fannie and Freddie in order to, you know, that was just in Boston, in order to get this thing to happen. And how many of those were you um, successful with of the 53? Well, some of them were just protests in front of Fannie and Freddie headquarters or in public spaces. But we were able to either prevent the evictions most of the time or, you know, just exact such a huge um, public relations disaster price from Fannie and Freddie, even when they'd succeed, that I think they took a look at this and just said, we've got to, we've got to change policy. So, you know, we were just, uh, and it wasn't just us, it was all across the country and SAFE was involved, but there was actions everywhere. So how many uh, families are you expecting to be impacted by this change that just happened a few weeks ago? Well, hundreds in the Boston area, certainly. And we have, we have a lot of members who are facing imminent eviction by Fannie or Freddie who suddenly, you know, have a second wind. We have a lot of members where nonprofits had offers on the table to buy the house and sell it back to them. So suddenly those negotiations are going forward. We had a nonprofit that was offering to buy seven or eight properties in one neighborhood in Boston that they were going to make into permanently affordable housing. There were occupied properties and uh, Fannie was not willing to negotiate. And now suddenly they are. So there's all kinds of things going forward at once that we're, uh, you know, we can kind of hardly keep track of it right now, but it should, some good outcomes will happen. Uh, you know, as in all things, uh, we wanted to, to go further because um, we want Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac to do principal reduction so that you don't have to buy the property from them, just reduce the amount that's owed. And uh, so we're going to keep working on that, and Mel Watt hasn't ruled that out yet, so we're, we, we're going to write to the city national coalition that we're part of is going to go meet with Mel Watt in January and try to press that. Josh, are you expecting any uh, impact in Seattle from that change? Well, um, J Jeremy Griffin, the uh, president of SAFE, uh, he's, he's done a lot of research on this and, and thought a lot about it. He told me he thinks that this has really come uh, like five years too late. In, uh, in Seattle, the, uh, the, the value of the homes is, is a actually like back up above bubble rates. And so... Uh, it's it's like reducing reducing the it's not i mean it's 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 very it's very uh it's a good it's a good thing that this is happening but uh right now it's not really going to help us that much in seattle uh we need a lot more uh a lot more reform a lot more changes in, in on policy here but it's it's good that this that this we're seeing some movement yeah this is a big problem it's true in boston too that uh they're maybe not up to, to bubble level, but values have been really been rising throughout Boston. And a lot of the, um, what they call gateway cities in Massachusetts, which are around Boston, it's much more of a big deal because, you know, in, in Brockton, for instance, which is 10 miles south of Boston, you know, values, I think something like 47% of all the mortgages are still underwater. So that's potentially a huge number of homeowners that could benefit from this. We're also starting to try to demand of Fannie and Freddie that, when they sell to a nonprofit, that they actually sell below market and that the amount of money that is below market would go to pay off some of their historic pledges that they never followed through on to make contributions to the National Housing Trust Fund out of their profits. And uh, they made, when they were bailed out in 2008, they promised to do that and never did it until just a week ago. They, they threw in the towel on that. But um, one way to do that would be to reduce the sales, uh, the sale value of some of these properties so that homeowners or nonprofits can get the properties and create affordable housing so that um, the foreclosure crisis in Boston, what's happening, I think in Seattle too probably, is that the foreclosure crisis is being quote unquote solved by creating a new price, a new crisis, which is more of a displacement crisis generally. I don't know if you've, you guys feel that in, in Seattle? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the problem is most people that could easily be foreclosed on have already been foreclosed on. And now we have all these empty houses and a lot of the the new uh, expensive condos going up, um, it's it's uh, it's a huge huge bubble, and um, it's kind of kind of getting ready for the next crash, and uh, continuing to fight for the uh, for the members' uh, homes that, that are already involved in safe as we do outreach. But it it, it it's in a in a in a short term view, it's like well, things are resolving themselves. But at the same time, if you look a little bit further down the road it's it's kind of it's kind of scary that we're going to be looking at a another big opportunity for organizing regrettably because we haven't resolved any of the fundamentals that put us here to begin with 
Right. Certainly, if you look at a market that you would say is functioning in a way that's, you know, that's proper for the for the Democratic majority, it would be one that is allowing people to buy or rent space, housing space in the in the neighborhoods that they grew up in. And this housing market is not allowing that. It's a dysfunctional housing market. In Boston right now, which which has the dubious distinction of being the city worst hit by gentrification in the country, according to the Federal Reserve Bank, um, you know we're seeing doubling of rents. You know, like you know, we had a member come in the other day that said, "My rent's been doubled, sixteen hundred dollars." And we said, "That's terrible. Your rent's been doubled to sixteen hundred dollars." And she said, "No, it's been doubled from sixteen hundred dollars to thirty-two hundred dollars." And now you have op-ed pieces in the local paper, the Boston Globe, saying that developers are working really hard to create um, housing opportunities for the middle class and they're citing figures like $2,600 a month and the median renter income in Boston is $35,000. And what's the disconnect there is just profound. I mean, you know, how, how does somebody making $35,000 a year, you know, by HUD standards can afford $900 in rent and here the rents are going for $2,600 and that's supposed to be a middle class income. That's a completely dysfunctional market. Yeah. So talk about the the process you take people through when they come to your your organizations. Um, I assume a lot of people who get engaged are coming because they are facing foreclosure. Is that right? So can you talk about that? Uh, I mean, the people we have the most success with, um, it's it's real to them. They got skin in the game. They're I mean, they're 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 facing displacement. Or they've already been displaced, and uh, and they identify very closely with um, our struggle to uh, to achieve housing as a human right. Um, so I mean, that's uh, it's uh, you know that's that's the base of people that we're organizing is the people that are facing displacement. So you know, we, we when we reach out to people, we get them involved, and um, we try to get uh, we get them to the meetings, and um, you know, they tell their stories, and people are affected by. And medical problems, uh, loss of jobs, and all, all sorts of issues with this dysfunctional economy, and um, you know we welcome them and try to turn that uh, into a, a culture of uh, defiance and resistance, and uh, and get people working together to defend each other's our neighbors and stay in their homes. Yeah, what Safe does well, and I think that's uh, important for any organizing, is that. You know, people come into our space and they're, they've really been told so many times that it's their fault that they're being foreclosed or even their fault they're being evicted by a bank or a co corporate landlord type that they're just really demoralized and they get to our space and that, and what SAFE does so well is, uh, you know, makes, creates an understanding of solidarity that says this just isn't your fault. It does, it is somebody's fault, but it's not your fault. And, uh, so if you, it's, it's righteous to join in a common struggle to keep your home. And uh, that having that uh, that rock taken out of your knapsack, so to speak, is really important in people's ability to fight. And you, at your uh, Steve, at your organization, City Life, you kind of have a two prong approach, both legal and then uh, organizing a protest. The sword and the shield. Yeah, can you talk about that briefly? Well, we. For a long time, even before the foreclosure crisis in our tenant organizing, we've kind of uh, understand that what we're trying to do is raise the cost of displacement to the owner. So whether it's a bank or a corporate landlord, you know, they have the legal right to do this displacement. So we can't just rely on the courts. So our, our uh, campaigns have to raise the cost of doing the displacement. And so we do that through the sword and the shield. The shield is kind of vigorous legal defense. So we're using every opportunity procedurally in the courts to stop or slow down the eviction process. And the purpose of doing that is to create the space to let the sword take effect, which is public pressure and public protest. And we've many times shown that um, even though we may not, even though somebody may not have the legal right to fight a rent increase or, or a bank, uh, bank supported eviction, they can effectively do so if they hang in there long enough and use a public relations weapon skillfully. And so that's what we, that this has become, we, we also use the metaphor partly because, um, you know, we, we want to convey to people that this is, this is just a fight. You're in a, you know, you're in a, you're in a fight for your home. This isn't a technical thing. So you need both the sword and the shield to do that. But it's been, it's been very effective in terms of keeping people's homes over the years. Because you're in a battle, you know, you're in a battle. Yeah. 
we say offense and defense. We try to put a little spin on it. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, we send people to uh, Northwest Justice Project. We, we don't actually we don't have uh, the resources to work directly with lawyers, but uh, some of the lawyers we work with they don't they don't really understand what it is we're doing and how it's helpful to them. And then they see uh, they see us working. Uh, they see our our protests and they see like the the media coverage and then they see the changes. Uh, in the court and and in the government, and all of a sudden they're like, "Oh, what you're doing is great." Uh, so it's I think it's going to take a while for us to uh, to develop the kind of infrastructure that uh, City Life has. I'd love to see Safe working with uh, Seattle University law school students, getting them canvassing with us, and then getting uh, the law school students uh, helping people with like HUD intake packets and stuff like that, which is just a nightmare for people that are you know trying to get help. And um, hopefully we can get some lawyer, more lawyers in uh, in the area understanding how organizing, uh, you know, not only like helps what they do, it makes it makes uh, it makes actually helping people much more possible. Where it changes changes what's possible when when we're organizing, we're cha- we're changing possibilities. Whereas if you're just if you're just looking at it from like a purely legal framework which is supported by bailout money and settlement money you're looking at it in kind of a tiny little box and uh, we're trying to bust that open um and and put a apply what steve calls a moral lens to this uh so i mean like just recently uh washington state basically legalized fraud you know most for most people we think oh well fraud that's um that's that's criminal but not anymore. Not for not for banks. Banks can commit fraud, and it's not. It's just that's just what they do. And you know they can forge signatures. They can do all this this crazy stuff. They can give you predatory loans. They can that are basically like you know mathematically they're going to take they're going to take your money and eventually take your house. And they can give that loan to you. Um, but that's fine. That's that's fine. It's totally legal for them to do. Well. You know that's because of this free market insanity, and there's no such thing as a free market. And and we, I think during the crash we started to question that as a as a society whether like this 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 the neoliberal uh, rhetoric about the free market, but um, it's uh, you know uh, corporate power is very entrenched and very powerful, and uh, it's it's going to take a lot more organizing, a lot more uh, a lot more of this uh, fighting back to break that open totally. So that we can um, chain the banks down again, like we did in the '30s. I mean, you know, there's been lots of articles written. You know, Matt Taibbi is famous for this from Rolling Stone, but about the failure to jail any of the people who have done this. And you know, HSBC, the giant bank, was uh, you know found guilty of money laundering, la- laundering drug money to the tune of something like six hundred million dollars. Talking about a crime, but nobody went to jail for that because. They frankly admitted that if you start jailing the bankers, then the financial system is going to collapse. So what a situation to be in that, you know, we're maintaining the system of, of, of vast private accumulation of wealth and the, and the stability of our whole economy depends on it. And so nobody's going to go to jail for, for fraud. And, you know, we face the question naturally for our members coming in of how do you confront such a vast system? And... You know, can can you know these methods like the sword, the shield, or offense and defense really work? And you know, I remember when we were first starting the bank organizing back in two thousand and eight, we had a series of eviction blockades one month, and we lost them all. In the, in the sense that three families got evicted that month, one by Bank of America, one by J.P. Morgan Chase, and one by Deutsche Bank. And but the people who were involved in losing their homes are all still involved in the movement. And I remember one woman was sitting on her stoop with a reporter from the Boston Globe after Bank of America had evicted her. This is in September of 2008. And she was saying to the Globe reporter, you know, Bank of America thinks that they've won, but they haven't. And that eviction prompted, and the messaging around it, uh, prompted this campaign against Bank of America, which itself lasted about three years, and directly led to a lot of, uh, you know, settlements and a lot of people uh, getting their homes back and you know that required that those original people who lost their homes had to understand that even though they lost their home they were part of a, a much larger effort they got other people their homes back and in some ways miraculously the people really understood that and that's why they were they're still in our movement today in fact one woman went through uh 
four eviction blockades before J.P. Morgan Chase finally got her. And then she went on to occupy a vacant a building that had been for another vacant building that had been foreclosed by a different bank, and she's still in that space. So the people's heroism in this fight has been just miraculous. So how is this? So uh, we've just got a few minutes left. So with your conference and this work, how is this uh, radical in that it seems that people keeping their homes or and or getting their homes back from large financial institutions it sh should be anything but radical? Well, that's for sure. I mean, you know, we had a, one of our staffers at City Life used to say in the beginning of all our meetings, you know, City Life is not normal, you know. You're not, you're not in a normal space, but it should be normal. And certainly uh, getting people's homes back isn't radical, but questioning what is almost a state religion of the market, that is radical. Again, it shouldn't be, but we really worship the market here, you know, in a lot of ways. And, uh, you know, we, we're, even if you just take a pretty uh, moderate view and say, you know, the market is a tool like a hammer, and if you're trying to turn a screw, you don't want to use a hammer on it. You know, if the market doesn't work, you use a different tool to get what you want democratically. But that's violating one of the uh, one of the canons of the state religion. So that's what's radical. Well, and you've got you've got Orwell too. You know his famous quote: uh, "Speaking truth, uh, you know, is revolutionary during really crazy times." Right? I mean, like this this shouldn't be uh, radical. This shouldn't be like a you know to keep people in their homes and let people pay their bills and stay in their homes and the banks won't even let people pay to stay in their homes i mean that's the insanity behind this that's how uh sort of out of control wall street has gotten uh, and uh and that's what we have to change but it yeah we're basically just pointing out things that are kind of common sense that are that are ethical that are moral and that in some ways uh, used to be legal, right? Like uh, these usury, usury laws that we had in place or Glass-Steagall that, that kept, the, kept the casino capitalism out of the, out of the regular uh, commercial banking. Um, this, the, the, this, is what we're, this is what we're trying to address. And uh, yeah, it shouldn't be, it shouldn't be something that's, uh, that's seen as something on the fringe. And I think actually if it wasn't for the corporate media, uh, we wouldn't we wouldn't even be talking about it like this. I think the majority of people in this country, I think, you know, if you go back to Occupy, like the ninety nine percent are in agreement with, uh, with with what we're talking about. No, there's uh, as we move into more general anti displacement resistance again in Boston and in Seattle. You know, we have this strange phenomenon that everything that people do to improve their neighborhood, whether it's you know fighting for you know, crime watches for less crime or better parks or better schools or new transit stops. All those things drive the, out the very people who did the work. And as our society is supposed to be, it's not, but it's supposed to be based on this idea that if, that if you work hard and you do the work, you should get the benefit. But in fact, in urban real estate neighborhoods, the way the system works is that the people who do the work get driven out and somebody else makes the profit. And, you know, that's just wrong, but you know, our society is set up in a way that tries to hide that whole fact and make it seem normal. All right. Well, with that, we are unfortunately out of time. We've been talking with Steve Meacham. He is lead organizer at City Life Vida Urbana, and Joshua Ferris is lead organizer at SAFE, Standing Against Foreclosure and Eviction. And uh, luckily, people uh, can can plug into your conference that is happening later today at uh, lunch starting at noontime. Yeah, one o'clock of the workshops, and then uh, we got our panel discussion with an outstanding panel at 5 p.m. tonight. That's at the Hillman City Collaboratory. It's um, South Seattle on Rainier and um, Orcas. Yeah, 5623 Rainier Avenue South. And uh, your, your organizations themselves, they have uh, websites? Indeed. City Life is www.clvu.org. City Life Vita Urbana, clvu.org. Very good. Yeah. And SAFE is uh, safeinseattle.org. Safeinseattle.org. S A F E. All right. Well, I want to thank you both uh, very much for coming and spending time with us this morning. Thank you, Mike. Thanks, yeah. Josh. Yeah, Mike, always great to be here.